more sim training. And again, she's going to be talking to us today about simulation and trauma, some things that Ron and uh, John mentioned earlier. Thank you. And some other stuff. Um, yeah. But uh, actually, it's great. Glad to be speaking here and kind of glad to be going last because everyone else has really set up my talk very well. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some uh, a variety of ways of simulating trauma and uh, the role of simulation in trauma. How do I? I don't know how to work a clicker. <laughs> or it's not. Okay. So I have no financial disclosures, and my I really have one objective for this talk, and that's to get you to think a little bit about the application of simulation to ATL. Uh, to trauma that goes beyond just the simple ATLS. So let's start with a case, because that's the kind of what we're here for. Um, because you have simulated ATLS algorithm over and over and over again, you are not distracted by this gentleman's uh, <laughs> femur sticking out of his leg. Paramedics bring him in after a motorcycle accident, and you start with your ABCs. That's been ingrained into your head. Airway is intact. He's speaking to you, actually. Tells you that he flew off of his motorcycle and landed on his right side. Bilateral breath sounds equal and present. Um, and his pulses are actually equal throughout. You've got an IV in place. You're getting him on the monitor. You note that he's a little tachycardic. His leg's getting a little more swollen. And you know that the thigh is one of the five places in the, that you can bleed out your entire blood volume. So you look up, you see that his heart, his blood pressure is 100 systolic, and because the blood bank's a little far away in your institution, you say, we should think about massive transfusion protocol, someone should go get blood, and you go back to your primary survey. Fast exam is negative. <sighs> His pelvis is pretty stable. Ortho's there at this point. They're playing with his toes. You know that his <laughs> you know that his right arm is a little deformed. You go to roll him. He moans. His eyes kind of close, and he sort of mumbles, "Where am I?" You repeat a blood pressure. Now it's systolic of 80. You look up and you say, "Where's my blood?" Did anyone get the blood? I thought I called for a massive transfusion protocol. So I think we've all been in some situations similar to this, although I hope not, or if we haven't yet, we will be. And if I were to ask you in a debriefing of a simulation what happened here, what went wrong, you would all say, well, it was a failure of closed loop communication. But we all know that if we're the only person doing closed loop communication in the trauma room, we don't look cool. And we all really want to look cool as emergency medicine doctors. So we kind of don't do it if no one else is doing it. Um, and actually, this is Do Dr. Marshall set me up amazingly for this, because this is one of the areas where we actually have data. If we have, and Dr. Marshall showed all the data to you this morning, but in case you weren't here, if, if your program has a regularly instituted program of in situ, meaning in the environment, trauma simulations that involve all disciplines, multiple specialties, we have shown that there is a statistically significant improvement in time to operating room, time to intubation, time to um, CT scan, and even some studies that have shown improved in hospital, so during that initial hospital stay, morbidity and mortality for patients. In light of that data, how can we not be simulating and debriefing traumas in the emergency department? I think we really should be. And, and I actually think the reason for this, and Dr. Marshall and Dr. Simon alluded to this also this morning, is that we're doing more than just teaching closed loop communication and teamwork, but we're actually changing the culture of our trauma team. By having these regular sessions, we're setting a standard for what excellent trauma care looks like. When we, set, when we set that standard, we also, by involving every person who's involved, are showing them that their role as a trauma team member matters. 
We're empowering them to hold everyone on the team to, this, to the excellent standard. So, you know, I think this is really a place for us to improve on trauma care just by debriefing even cases that are real, that actually happen, and including every person. Now, closed loop communication is cool because it's the thing for everyone to do, and it's the standard. So I want to move on a little bit, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about thinking about thinking, because I geek out on this. I'm sorry, and um, but I just want to introduce two concepts really quickly. Maybe many of you know about them. Some of you may not. One is active. This idea of active memory, which is a cognitive psychology, neuropsychology, learning theory sort of thing, and that's that when you're dealing with any one thing, it, you're using your active or working memory. And that's um, really what allows you to sit here and listen to me right now and remember the talk that happened earlier this morning and also check your cell phone. But there are limits on your active memory. And the, there's a theory that you can really only hold five plus or minus two constructs in your active memory at any one time, which is why it's kind of hard really to multitask. So if you imagine yourself in the trauma bay, more than seven things are happening at one time. And I promise you not all of us here can hold seven constructs in our active memory at once. I know I can't. So what do we do? Well, we, we chunk things that are similar into one construct, and that's called a heuristic. And, or a mental model that allows us to um, create space in our active memory for all the other things that are happening. So on the one hand we have, and I just had a baby so that's why baby hands. So on the one hand we have this heuristic mental model where we've chunked, such as our ATLS algorithm, right? That's a chunk we remember all as a whole. And that allows us to be more efficient, to think quick, to make quick decisions. But there are limitations, and some of several of the speakers before me have brought this up too. There are limitations to those algorithms because they don't apply to every context and every patient. And I think Dr. Melville talked a little bit about this, that you know every patient doesn't exactly fit the ATLS algorithm. So while you need your algorithm, you have to do everything. You also have to consider how is my patient different. So um, let's do a case. I don't have the patient's picture in front of you, but this patient is a notification by EMS for a stab wound to the left shoulder. He's brought into the emergency department and they say, yeah, it was bleeding a lot on the scene. They've got a nice big pressure dressing over his left shoulder. He's 20, he looks good. You look at him and you're like, ah, oh, there's nothing wrong with this guy. Part of you wants to send him to fast track. But because you have learned your ATLS algorithm, you've chunked it, it's a mental model, you start with A, B, C. Airways intact, he's speaking. Tells you, yeah, I only got stabbed once in my shoulder. I was just standing on the edge of the road. Somebody stabbed me. I don't know what happened. Bilateral breath sounds are equal and present. Pulses are attached throughout. You've got your large war ID, which you put on the right side because this injury is on the left. You um, have him on a monitor, and he's tacky to 120, and his systolic blood pressure is 90. Now you're kind of a little more worried about what, what's going on, what can be going on. You get blood out of your blood freezer that's right there. You go to, you remove the dressing. You look, there's like just a two centimeter laceration that's not really bleeding. Um, really like right under where the portable is written. You can see like a little hematoma there. Go to roll the patient and suddenly blood gushes out of that two centimeter laceration in pulsating streams, covers the wall, covers everyone in the room, Hopefully you're all in your PPE. And a resident helpfully sticks a finger in the hole. You roll them back down on the x-ray plate and you get this x-ray. And in case you haven't seen it yet, since you've all been staring at this x-ray for so long, I helpfully outlined the lung margin there. And there's a, pneumo a pretty significant pneumothorax on the left side. So now you're kind of at a juncture where you can keep going down your ATLF out S ATLS algorithm, or you can maybe deviate from it depending on your context and your situation. And so what I'd like to do 
is go over, I didn't go forward. Okay, I wanna talk about a few things that you, really three questions that I would like you to think about adding to your mental model for ATLS and really for any resuscitation that you're part of. There are a ton of heuristic traps and cognitive biases that you can fall prey to, and I don't have time to go into them all here, but I think if you can build these three questions into your approach to resuscitation, it's gonna save you so many times and it's gonna help you avoid falling into most of those traps. And actually, I, I love that Dr. Melville on the panel talked about this a little bit. I'm sorry I keep calling you out, but you absolutely, um, I think you're doing this and hopefully teaching all of your residents to do this because this is basically how you talked about your approach to patients and I think that's amazing. Um, so the questions are, what could I be missing? What could go wrong? What's the worst thing that could happen here? And if it happens, how will I deal with it? And is my heuristic model, is my mental model, is ATLS in this case, appropriate to the context of this patient? Because you, while you need your heuristic model to make you fast and efficient, you still have to take your individual patient's context into consideration. And even your hospital context, community, trauma center, it all matters. So, so let's go back to our patient. Depending on the context, this is the full x-ray, we could do a few different things. If I ask myself, what am I missing? Well, I probably know what, I may not be missing too much, but then if I go to my next question and say, well, what's the worst thing that could happen here? Is it, well, I'm gonna ask myself, well, is it gonna be that he's bleeding out from a potential blood vessel laceration that's under his clavicle? Or is it gonna be that he gets attention pneumothorax. Now I'm gonna look at my patient. His oxygen saturation is 100%. He's not, he's still talking to me. He's not tachypnic. I think that maybe the, the injury to the blood vessel is gonna trump breathing and I'm gonna skip breathing if I'm in a level one trauma center and my surgeon is right there and ready to take him to the OR. Because I know that I can't put a pressure dressing under a clavicle. Maybe I could put a Foley in there and it might help. So, so I might decide I'm not even going to do, do, take 20 minutes to deal with airway and breathing in the ED. I'm going to send him right to the OR. Or if I'm in a community center, maybe I'm going to be giving him blood and he seems to get a little more stable and I put a Foley in that hole and I'm, I've got the helicopter en route to take him to the level one trauma center, maybe I will intubate him, even though he's speaking to me, and put in a chest tube, because I'm afraid that that tension pneumothor that, that, <coughs> that pneumothorax may turn into a tension pneumothorax before he can get there. So the context matters so much, and your patient matters so much. And that's why, really, the th three questions I think will really help you, and I think you should simulate them. So in summary, Simulate and debrief with the entire trauma team to create a culture of excellent trauma care. So that everyone knows what that means, from the x-ray tech to the surgeons. And when you're simulating and debriefing, add variety to your cases and change the context. And debrief, asking yourself these questions. What am I missing? What's the worst thing that could happen? Is this appropriate for my context? because that's gonna help you avoid all those heuristic traps. And you should do it enough that it becomes part of your mental model and your own heuristic <coughs> guidelines, just like Dr. Melville. Um, so I wanna leave you with this quote, which is from um, Kevin Menes. He is the physician who was in charge of, you can read it, he's the physician who was in charge of the Las Vegas uh, ED, and this comes from EP Monthly, where the article that he co-authored with Tintinelli was. And this shows that he also basically has been simulating a mass casualty incident and asking himself all of those hard questions. And I would propose that the reason that, that, that he and his team did such an outstanding job taking care of that nightmare situation is because he did this. And he thought it sounds odd, 
and kind of silly, but in fact, this is what we should all be doing all the time. It's going to make us all better doctors. So thank you, and I have a list of references that I, in case you want them, because I didn't want to put them on my slide.